hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Nachtwaffen Pilot with Penny Bradley. And today's guest is Mary Sutherland. Mary Sutherland is an author and researcher focusing her work on consciousness studies, ancient history, and unusual phenomenon. She is a hands-on researcher and creator of one of the largest websites on the internet with hundreds of pages providing information on the paranormal, UFOs, ancient races, and their cultures, sacred sites, and PowerPoints of the world underground tunnels and cave systems, dimensional worlds, metaphysics, etc. The governor of Kentucky commissioned her as a Kentucky colonel for her work on the ancient sites of Kentucky. For the last five years, she has been exploring, mapping, and documenting the ancient underwater structures of Rock Lake near Aztalan. For the last 14 years, she has been documenting the ancient sites around Burlington, Wisconsin. Truth is her passion. She believes it is through truth that we will break ourselves, ourselves free of our present entanglements in life. When we become free, we create our own personal story of the hero story suggested by Joseph Campbell. Welcome Thank to the you. show, Mary. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for asking me to be on, Penny. Well, thanks for coming. Um, You're more than welcome. <laughs> I ordered one of your books. It still oh, has it still hasn't shown up. I That's did because what happened was you caught me in a bad time because well, fortunately I sent you that PDF. Yes, right? you did. You did I, was, I was able yes, to do that. Right, that's when I got sick, and I've been down for several weeks, and uh, with uh, bronchial pneumonia. Yeah, and so I, I just started that feeling. On your wall. Yeah, so I now yesterday I started feeling better, so I got your book went out. So I mean, sorry for how long it's, it's okay. taken. But, you it's know, okay. You, no, no. When I when I read on on your your yeah. Facebook wall that you had pneumonia, I was like. Oh, I was at a conference and didn't see it while I was gone. And I came back and I'm like, oh, she's sick. Yeah. Uh -oh. I, I better have a back backup plan because I'm not going to make her come on if she's still feeling bad. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it finally broke yesterday. So, you know, I was feeling really good. Well, thanks to my friend Kathy here. So, hey, Kathy. Um, yeah, Hello. she um, she lives in another town an hour and a half away, but uh, every day she did the drive back and forth to work, you know, to make sure I was okay. And uh, otherwise, I would have been in the hospital if it hadn't been for her. But uh, hospitals are scary work. places. Yeah, good friends, good friends. So yeah, so I'm feeling really good now. Okay, uh, the book that I ordered was about the red-haired giants, but I understand a lot of your work has to do with investigating the mounds in the Mississippi and Ohio valleys, and now also in Wisconsin. So right. um, I guess we should start there. I did notice in your book that you quote from Madame Blavatsky quite a bit. I love her. I, I take it you do too. Um, I've, re I've read her book. Um, it was at the wrong stage of my story for me to really appreciate it. I think at this point I would appreciate it more. Um, I think before I even started grasping what she was talking about, I think I probably had to read it three times. But yeah. <laughs> but it it's a very worthwhile book. Uh, um, I started uh, I even though she's been dead all this time, mm -hmm. I still look at her as one of my mentors. Uh, she was um, uh, she was a, a woman you know that was way ahead of her time. Yeah, and, she was. Uh, yeah, and traveled the world over learning. Uh, I mean, 
I think that, um, I mean, all, like uh, she, I think she took two trips by um, um, uh, wagon train, you know, across the, uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast, took the, and then went down into, um, took the ocean down into, uh, 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 let's see, uh, got down into Africa and South American places like that, and and was uh, uh, visiting with medicine men and uh, shamans and that learning all these lost secrets or, you know, yeah. um, uh, very, uh, very uh, uh, held to your chest secrets that the shamans yeah. and that I held. And, uh, and then she came out and wrote her books and, and exposed it for all of us to learn from too. So uh, yeah, I, I hold her in high esteem. Yeah. Amazing lady. Yeah, it's something that a lot of folks don't appreciate that even her lifetime, a hundred, a little bit over a hundred years ago, it was still wagon trains. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and women were not allowed to uh, wear pants or get out there and travel the way she did, but um, she met, she did it. She, she accomplished quite a bit, and she founded the Theosophy Society. Now, I have read more of Manly Hall's work. Um, it was, oh, yeah. yeah. It was yeah, easier for me to understand at the time I was going through that. So, uh, but yeah. It's hard to follow. I mean, the, the work that he's done and... Uh, and the information he has shared is invaluable, but it, it's always been difficult for me to follow him. You, you know his, uh, he, you know his, his speeches, his lectures, and that because he talks so slow and draws everything <laughs> out. But I mean, his work though, I mean, you got to bear with it because he has so much to share. I tend to not listen to them. I tend to read their stuff. Um, yeah, with him, it's probably more advisable just to read his work. <laughs> <You know. laughs> there, there are a couple of folks that, that I love listening to their voices. Alan Watts would be one of them. But mo most philosophers, occultists, I read their work. Uh, yeah. So... I well, guess I'm a are... visual learner instead of a uh, hearing one. Well, books always go more in depth than yeah. you know than they can cover in an interview like what we're talking doing today or you know a lecture. Yeah. So especially you know like if they do a series like with my books, um, the Red Hair Giants was book number one out of five book series in search of ancient man. So, you know, what you miss in one book, pick up in the other. And what you miss yeah. there, you pick up in the other until finally, you know, you run out of things to say, which I never do. <laughs> so actually, it was supposed to be a five book series, but uh, I've, I've actually now got six books out on the giants of North America, red haired giants now. So, so I guess it's, um, I don't know, it's always been a, well, it was lost information. Yeah, and I think that I think that it's very important that we see both sides of the coin. You know, I mean, they say that history belongs to the conqueror. So and um, and so a lot of the history, you know, of these lost races have been you know lost, and um, you know they went into oblivion, and nobody knew about them, mm -hmm. and. What I did is I tried to bring that information back. I was the first person. Well, there was a, a Stephen Quayle. He had written on the Giants. But I was the first one that ever wrote on the red-haired Giants. Mm -hmm. and that well, I, had, and, uh, I had heard about them through my great-grandmother, whose mother was Creek. Yeah. So she had tribal information yeah so, and i'm uh, and i'm cherokee winnebago and, uh, my uh dad's other great-grandmother was uh cherokee yeah so. a lot of good information 
mm-hmm. came from you know, uh, some the information I got came from uh, the Cherokee. Um, but um, yeah, it's a shame that so many people just flat out ignored what the natives had to say about on the topic. Yeah. Well, a lot of that information wasn't being shared to the white person because they didn't feel that they were worthy of it, which we weren't at that time. No, but uh, um, the white folks up until maybe 30 years ago uh, have yeah. been basically genocidal maniacs. Yeah, so. I agree. I agree. <coughs> Excuse my cough. I still got a little bit of that, uh, that pneumonia, but not much, just the cough. So. But uh, yeah, it, uh, we need to bring that information back. It's very important. And, um, and I think that that's one of the things that you're seeing today, uh, you know, with all the anger that's going around and, you know, what they, you know, um, you know, anger among the various cultures, racism that, you know, I think a lot of that is because before we had our heads stuck in the sand and we just listened to who it was like uh, listening to the wheel that uh, squeaked the loudest. And, but um, we, but it lately, maybe within the last 10 years or so uh, we're becoming awakened and we're starting to question things. And as we question things, we're getting answers that we didn't expect. And the more this is brought out in the open, people react emotionally. Mm-hmm. And with that, with reacting emotionally like that, this is where you're seeing all this, these protests and things like that, because they're saying, wait a minute, I, you know, this no longer works for us. We want to know the truth, you know, yeah. and we um, all want to live as a, as a human race instead of, you know, the, uh, you know, how it has been designed, you know, since way back in the Sumerian days, I guess. Well, I see that we've been set up in feudalism and we have been since Sumerian days and Mm -hmm. that the folks at the top of the pyramid have tried to keep the folks at the bottom divided so that we don't kill them. Right, exactly. And in the meantime, America has become so interbred that we're basically one people anyway, no matter what skin color we pop out with. So Mm -hmm. I think the divisions are mostly ridiculous. Uh, One thing before it slips my mind, because this does happen to me in your book, and I cannot remember the man's name, but you said there was a whistleblower who talked about the Smithsonian literally taking all of those bones and artifacts and dumping them into the ocean. Right. And I got so angry. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, this kind of happened back in the days of um, uh, the beginning of more, uh, yeah, beginning of Mormonism with uh, Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. and uh and the smithsonian yeah uh being used by um uh, by uh, corporate religion by the church okay during the catholic church at that time but what happened was joseph smith had discovered um on the hill of kumara Mm -hmm. these giant bones and um and also a, a tablet and the tablet talked about this this extinct race of giants and the battles that they had and the last battle was on the battle uh, or on the hill of kumara in the in new york so joseph smith he took advantage of this and created mormon uh, the well uh, today i guess they call them the latter day saints but i call them mormons but he created the religion and then he set forth all these, um, uh, all of his pe- the various people, men of the congregation, to dig up these uh, these mounds, so that they because they realized that in these mounds was more information mm-hmm. and artifacts, and so it was it was a great time to you know uh, to renew history, mm-hmm. to find out the truth of history. 
and to reintroduce this lost race of giants. So when this was happening, the Smithsonian or the church through the Smithsonian, they also sent out their people to dig up as many skeletal remains, artifacts, and information on this lost race. So it was almost like a it was almost like a war going on between Mormonism and uh, uh, you know the church of who could get to the information the fastest. So the um, the uh, camp, the church. Uh, what they did is they collected as much as they could. And then what they couldn't collect and hide from the public, they destroyed. And one of the, uh, one of the things that they did was loaded up a lot of these skeletal, uh, giant skeletal remains and uh, put them on a barge out into the ocean and just dumped them. Yeah, it's, it was there. Yeah, it, uh, well, you hear that all the time anyhow, People, they, they discover things, contact the Smithsonian or, you know, some sort of a institute like that, you know, maybe more locally. And uh, they say, well, you know, send, the, send us the bones, send us the artifacts, and we'll investigate it. And then it conveniently gets lost. Yeah. The staff says, well, we don't have it here. Yeah. They, they say it all the time. Yeah, I've come across so many different regular. things. And, yeah, I come across, you know, because I am a hands-on researcher, and I've come across so many different artifacts, and and I'm a, always, you know, requested, you know, please send them to us so that we can, you know, help you out, you know, but it's just like, no, because they know what will happen to them, so I just, wow. uh, you know, sometimes they'll take me years and years and years, you know, to figure something out, you know, pertaining to a certain artifact, but uh, at least I have it, you know, and I know where it is. Yeah, you have me. it. You have it safely stashed. Yeah. And and the information as I get it always goes out to my public. That's you know, the best way through. to handle it. Yeah, I either put it out on my websites or through <clears throat> my Facebook or through interviews such as this or you know as a speaker through my books whatever. But anything I know, I've always made that promise to myself. Anything that I learn. I will always share with my public. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, I've been sharing most of what I come up with. Um, mine is uh, recovered memories from altars. So, um, wow. yeah, that's very interesting. Fun trip. <clears throat> but uh, the Order of Dolores Cannon's work. Um, I, do you use hypnosis, or how, how do you go about doing it? Um, my life partner is an Iroquois shaman, and uh -huh. we got the original <laughs> the original altar that was activated was done by the C, by the NSA. They had a team of Russian translators assigned to me, and they literally used my remember code from my childhood. And to figure out this big lump of memories. Uh, Is there something similar to star seed activation? Um, I would probably be considered a star seed, but this was a military black op. Oh, okay. It's more on the order of MK Ultra. And, and were you? And I'm curious because I am a researcher. Um, okay. Were you, was your family military? Your, your parents? No, uh, oh. but my family was bloodline. Uh huh. Okay. So uh, we, my grandparents probably knew, but my father didn't, and I certainly didn't. Um, I did my family tree on Ancestry.com, <clears throat> and when I connected the second line to Robert the Bruce. Um, I suddenly got contacted by strangers. So, uh, Robert, uh, Robert Bruce was uh, um, came from uh, my husband's lineage was goes back there. There are a lot of us that do, but this, you know, that's the red hair. Yeah, you know, there, there's your there's your your red haired people, your race, red race, the Scots, yeah. the Irish, you know, Sumerian. Yeah. 
the, these folks are descended from some of those way back in time. Right, yeah, yeah. and with the red-haired giants, it, it shows how that lineage works. I'm sure that you read that, uh, how that, uh, the red-haired mm -hmm. race, how the lineage works all the way through that, like what you're talking about, you know? Yeah. Through the, the, the Irish and that. The genetics from those red-haired giants is what these agencies were looking for. Right, right. So, um, yeah. For some are, reason, they, they feared that, uh, they feared that lineage. They still feel that, fear that lineage, but the, yeah. it. And, and the thing is, a lot, and I kind of want to uh, <clears throat> speak up on this uh, because a lot of people are at the uh, assumption of that um, the red-haired giants is just a race of Caucasian. But they really wasn't. There was all color. It's a it's a bloodline, uh, you know, uh, where you have like a little, little bit of red in your hair. Well, you can tell because they have like a little bit of red, auburn in their hair, freckles. You know, more of a rudish complexion. You know, more reddish. You know, than their skin tone. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. And a tendency to green or hazel eyes, and mm -hmm. you don't tan very well, and. The closer to the red-haired giants you are, the more likely that you'll glow in the dark. And, and, they're, and they're mystical. Yeah. They're, they have, they, the, they have, the military yeah. called it psi, psi abilities for mm -hmm. psionics. Yeah. And that was what they were really looking for were the psychic abilities. Great. Yeah. And, the, and this is one of the things that they were, you know, people feared them. You know, especially yeah. government was because, you know, the, 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 the magical capabilities that they had, you know. So, yeah. Very interesting race. So I call them race. What I've been doing with, with this radio show and the YouTube channel that goes with it is I've been documenting the community. And when I saw your work about the red-haired giants, I go, Oh, wow, she fits. <laughs> she fits. She helped. She has a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, that, that was part of why um, I asked you. And another part is we have a friend in common who was just super excited and said, you have to get Mary on your show. And then I oh, saw you. And then I, um, her first name's Diane. She doesn't want to be. Oh, okay. She doesn't want to be named. I can tell you after we're off there. <laughs> but uh, she was like super excited, wanted me to meet you. And, and I took a look at, at your work and your website and said, hmm, I like this lady already. <laughs> well, if you notice that my books, um, uh, they're not, you know how like a lot of authors, what they do, or writers, is what they do is they find most of their information on the internet, and then they put their own spin to it and put yeah. out a book. <clears throat> With me, what I do is I, I, the context of my books are based off of um, uh, legends, mm -hmm. uh, lore, uh, um, rare and um, uh, and rare books, lost books, um, hands-on uh, research, mm -hmm. and uh, and being getting out there, getting dirty, at going into communities, asking questions, you know, to the locals, you know, finding yeah. out, you know, and um, and then following up on it. So you well, know, so my books are a little bit more unique because I try to provide information that had been lost until I started writing about it again. Uh, I appreciated that you write at a common person's vocabulary level. Yeah, I try to, because yeah. I feel it's very important that everyone understand what I'm yeah. writing about. That, um, that's a big problem with a lot of the source documents is that they're written at a vocabulary level that you sit there and wonder, did I really understand that? <laughs> or at least I do. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and I try not to uh, put a whole lot of fluff in with my stuff. 
you know, yeah, I um, noticed that. I try, to, I, I try to stay to the point, you know, so it's not a whole bunch of uh, wasted words on empty pages, you know. Yeah. So, and there are pictures of the places you visited and some of the artifacts, and yeah. yeah, that I appreciated too. Because a lot of these times you're going through pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of words and what the picture you get in your head may not match at all so i i appreciate it and, and then of course you know how uh, you know misinformation gets started you know you repeat something something false you know and you keep repeating it eventually it becomes the truth whether it's the truth or not <sighs> Yeah. Um, my community has an it has a problem with someone will channel something yeah and then it becomes gospel yeah you can't you can't argue with it because so-and-so channeled it exactly yeah i don't channel and if you noticed also in my books what i do is i always give references sources yeah. that way people can't argue the point with me because there's yeah. the source there's the pictures and this is how it all falls into play. But when I first started, like I said, uh, with the red-haired giant, people were very, upset. researchers were very, very upset with me. I used to get hate mail. Why? Because I had the audacity to turn around and talk, actually talk and inter try to introduce to the world my theory that there was red-haired giants. That there was a race uh, of red-haired giants. I'm telling you, they uh, <laughs> hard. And the, uh, the natives uh, have been talking about it amongst themselves for right. centuries. Right, but like you said, 20 years ago, he wasn't allowed to talk about that stuff. He wasn't allowed to talk paranormal. Anything that went against, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the 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 mainstream, you know, and um, and and I would not back down. Because I had the, you know, I had the resources, you know, I, I, yeah. I had everything there to show, to prove that these, these, this red haired race of giants actually existed. And I was not going to back down because well, there was uh, researchers out there in the field, um, archaeologists and that out in the field that did, just did not want me sharing that information with anybody. So, you know, so I was the first website out there that even talked about red haired giants. And now, because of my tenacity, um, you can type in on a search engine uh, red haired giants, and there's, there's over a million uh, websites out there talking about red haired giants. Well, and that's just because I would not give up. I, I refused to back down because, you know, they, they started putting, you know, they started putting some weight down on me, some pressure. You know, that's just not me. You know, if I know something to be truth, it, nobody's going to change my mind on it unless they can prove to me otherwise. But I'm also open enough where if they can prove to me I'm wrong, I'll be the first one that goes out there and admits my that I am wrong. You know, you have yeah. to. The credibility is everything in this field. Yeah, it is. You have you have to have the intellectual honesty to say, well, I was wrong about that. Yeah. Um, that's, that's important. Um, it really is. Yeah. So. So when did you first find out about them? Oh, geez. Hmm. Wow. I'm trying to think when I started first writing on them. Gosh, let's see. Okay, um, probably about two thousand one, something like that. Okay. Yeah, I started doing research on them. Yeah, it's been a long time ago, several decades, and I'm always learning more. And, you know, and now because more people have gotten involved in this field of research, um, you know, they dig up information, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so and which is really great. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I don't look at other writers as competition. 
because they're fellow researchers as far as I'm concerned. And that, you know, that's a good attitude, yeah. Yeah, and so and you know, so I, I buy their books and study their work just as well as I do my own because you know they may have something new that uh, that I can use as well, you know, as far as helping me with my research. Uh, I listen to some of the folks in my community that the ones that are less channeling and more straight memory recall. Yeah. So, uh, the, uh, yeah I spent the a lot of time looking for historical documentation for what I was told out there to see okay, was I told the truth or was I told propaganda? Yeah. So that was my version of being intellectually honest was, yeah. you know, yeah. because when you're in a military black op, you don't know if they've told you the truth or not. Yeah, I agree. So. And, and, I, and I'm totally aware because I used to have my own radio station, BUFO Radio, there was, uh, this kind of dates me a little bit, but at that point in time, I think there was only four of us that actually had internet radio. There was uh, Coast to Coast uh, and uh, Jeff, um, um, I can't think. Well, there was a couple more, maybe two more. So anyhow, there, so there was like four of us. And um, anyhow, I used to do nightly shows. And mm. there was a lot of interviews I did with uh, with uh victims of um black op projects yeah. you know so I'm, I'm very familiar with you know what what people have gone through you know you know because of these uh black op projects some crazy things they do there's a lot of stuff that they have done to people in the name of national security that they should have been nailed to the wall and left there. <laughs> the reason I asked about military, if you were part of a military family, is in uh, my work, you know, when I was um, uh, broadcasting the radio um, and interviewing um, some of these victims, I, I found that most of these uh, people that were being used on these black op projects uh, were actually family members of military. Yeah, Which, I found you know, that it's been to me, you know, upsetting because of the fact that government, you know, says, you know, that this is, our, you know, we're so proud of our military and, you know, and they brag about the fact that how they take good care of the military, you know, the military people, you know, the servicemen and that, but then they have no problem going in and using them as guinea pigs in these black op projects too. There's still been a lot of people that have, uh, have their lives have been ruined because of it. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's, you know, there's the, you know, stories of um, Montauk, you know, when they, you know, that was uh, something that um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, where they were sending I, down. I spent six months at Montauk. Oh, did you spend? Okay. I, I have interviewed in, other in people. In 1961, 62. Uh, did they send you over? I was I was at I was initially abducted in 1959 and kept at Langley, and when my mind fracture process was completed, they sent me to Langley for six months, and so then they sent, were, there then have been with um, uh, split personalities. Um, I have 2,197 splits. Yeah, we. Uh, my community calls them two, alters. Uh, my friend Peter Moon, uh, he wrote uh, several books on the Montauk Project, and what they did to these children is just, is just. Uh, uh, he he talked about the later program that was run by Al Bielik and um, yeah, Duncan, so those folks. Um, that was after my time uh, they started in the late 70s and i was there in 61 62 so i was in a different program with the same folk 
well equipment. So very dehumanizing. I'm sorry that you went through that. Thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a nightmare that never goes away. So oh, no. that's why I came public was to talk about how children all over the world are kidnapped for these pro programs and mm -hmm. they're mind fractured and then used as slave labor in many, many, many different programs. And and it goes all the way to the top. I mean, to, oh, all yeah. the way up to Vatican. I mean, I mean, these, these people that are head of this, I mean, you can't touch them. They know it. They get away with it. Yeah, they know that they're going to get away with everything that, that, that they've done. But I'm yeah. making it public because at least the CIA, who did part of my mind fracture is theoretically under the oversight of Congress. So the people if can light a fire under Congress to investigate the CIA for child trafficking. But then again, you don't know how many people anymore are even involved, uh, you know, with, tra with trafficking. I mean, it goes in through the Senate, through the Congress. Traf you know, I mean, trafficking hmm. is one of the top three it's drugs weapons and human trafficking are the top three money makers on this planet yeah it's so, so yeah i'm just i'm sitting here blowing in the wind knowing it's not going to not going to change because most people see me as entertainment so the, um as Chris said, in the end days, and when I say end times, I'm not talking about the end of the world. I'm talking about the end of a cycle from Pisces mm. to um, Aquarius. But as Christ even said, that in the end days, all things shall be revealed. Mm -hmm. That's what and I'm I doing. It's revealing. Exactly what is happening right now is where our power is, is exposing the truth. And exactly. if we can that message out to as many people as possible, and then they share it with as many people as possible, then eventually our voices are heard. And I do believe that the time has, uh, has come that people are coming out of that deep slumber and are awakening and are listening. And, and that's where the turmoil right now is coming from. And eventually, maybe not in our lifetime, but eventually it will, you know, because we haven't, we've just begun Aquarius. So, I mean, we have that whole age to go through. And the age of Aquarius is, uh, it takes you from uh, the age of selfishness into the age of love and community. And, I, and I'm very hopeful that um, that, will, that is coming. And... Um, and I have hopes that That's um, something to our, our grandchildren can, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, be able to in, enjoy something that we have never seen. You know, the, that control factor being taken away and letting people live the lives as they were meant to live. So, hopefully, you know, I know that there's a, you know, you got to look at a glass half filled or half empty you know? <laughs> and I'm looking at good. it as this is my job yeah. I will keep doing my job as long mm -hmm. as I'm here and mm -hmm. <clears throat> or I succeed which <laughs> you know it's possible well, if, if you don't it's not likely it. but it's possible <laughs> well if you don't talk about it and you don't share your, the truth then you're you're compliant with it yeah, I'm so not you, you up with, by not talking and exposing, you end up just as guilty as the perpetrator. Yeah, that's how I feel about it. Um, I'm talking about it. I'm letting the people who have been through this know that they're not alone and that there's a lot more of us than people think. And, yeah. and uh, there are probably a couple of million of us out here oh it's for and, sure and less than one percent of us have any memory at all so it's it's yeah like i said i have a, 
you know, through my interviews with my radio show, I had um, I had interviewed other victims, you know, of the Montauk Project and some of these other black projects. And there was uh, yeah. another one that um, I had done. It, I think it was called um, Dar Darker Than Black or something like that, Deeper Than Black. But I think it was Darker Than Black. Um, but anyhow, it uh, they were using certain um, uh, sensitives to be able to communicate telepathically with aliens mm -hmm. you know, on other planets. And of course, now the government laughs at all of us because maybe we believe in aliens. But here they were doing the same type of, uh, well, they were more involved in uh, their research on aliens than we could ever possibly be. Well, there's a sub-branch of the NSA called the Labyrinth Group, and they did exactly Labyrinth, Labyrinth Group, yeah. and they were headed by the man who called himself A.R. Borden, and he had a team of seven folks who um, he was using their psychic abilities to interact with the beings we call Anunnaki yeah. to move their home world where it would not collide with earth this round. Yeah. And uh, I actually know all seven of them. Two of them still speak to me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they, they were quite successful in their program. And that was, that was a black op and yeah. Um, well, you know, a lot of that money uh, for Black Op projects was funded through HUD. Yeah. Or it was, um, yeah, and that funded yeah, through Cat HUD. Right? Catherine Fitz, I think I got her name right this time. Catherine Fitz was uh, undersecretary of HUD, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. And she noticed, she noted all the discrepancies in the funding from mm -hmm. a bookkeeping point of view and she speaks at several she still speaks at conferences about it yeah that there's enough money missing to definitely fund a secret space program yeah which is what i have memories of being part of yeah so um i my memories are serving with the germans in space yeah so and they thank you for it <laughs> huh as I said, they thank you for it. <laughs> uh, they rescued me when the Anunnaki were going to destroy me. Yeah. Yeah. They, a lot of people look back or, you know, they talk about, oh, you know, the Anunnaki will come back and save us. Well, I, I don't think that the Anunnaki are such good people. I don't know? either. Um, they picked me up. They put me inside something they called the truth machine. They were peeling off my altars and destroying them one by one, which, by the way, I'll let you know, that hurts. Yeah, and so. they had destroyed the second ones when the Germans in space showed up and rescued me. Oh, well, that's good. So I had to sit with my memories of what the Germans were like and think about, okay, what were these people really like? Because... Nazis in space would never have rescued me. Right. So um, I tell a different story than the rest of the whistleblowers for that very reason. Um, the Germans in space came and rescued me and I had to really look at why. Who were these people and what did they think they were doing and what were they about? And uh, so... Yeah, um, the breakaway called the breakaway civilization is very real and it's out there and it's much larger than people think. Uh, they went back in time on Earth to get the genetic diversity that they needed for their colonies, and uh, my memories include a thousand worlds with at least a billion people each. So we're talking over a trillion Germans in space. And these are Earth humans. They're not hybrids. Yeah, I, I've heard that too, that uh, a lot of them are being taken. 
uh, humans are being taken like to the moon and to the Mars, from different, you know, different places mm -hmm. in, out, you know, in space and um, used for slave labor. You know, well, these were for colonies. They weren't for that's what I'm saying, repopulating colonies. You know, so no, but, um, but you know, it, it's like going down a rabbit hole. You know, sometimes you think to yourself, or I do, it'd be best not to even know. You know, just kind of live that life. You know, with the ostrich, with the, you know, in the hole. But once you start going down that rabbit hole, you know, and I warn people about this. If you're going to go down that rabbit hole, you best be aware because once you start going, there's no stopping. You just keep well, going. You learn more and more and go deeper and deeper. And, and your the life NSA is didn't give me the option. Yeah. They, they sent a team to activate the altar. Yeah. And left it activated. So it's. <clears throat> It's literally a nightmare I can't wake up from. Right. And I have told people, they'll come to me, well, so-and-so says I was out there. And I say, do you have memories yourself? No. Then don't touch it. Because right. it's a nightmare you don't wake up from. You, if no. you don't have memories, leave it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you have memories you're having trouble living with, yeah, I, I'll listen. I'll help you get through it. But I'm not going to wake anybody up to that nightmare if I can help it. Right. I agree. But, but, but then in another sense, you have to expose at the same time. You know, so. I have to expose <laughs> the agencies taking children right. and the things that they do to those kids and some of the stuff that they make the kids do. Um, I, you know, it's, it's horrific. And the reason they took me was because I was this bloodline descended from the red haired giants. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. See, like with me, I, I was there where you're at, you know, exposing, you know, the black op projects and secret government mm -hmm. projects. But it just got to the point where my phones were, you know, my people would call me and you could hear the clicking sounds, you know, of, mm -hmm. you know, government agencies listening in on your conversations and, you know, and then you'd have these strange people walking around, you know, around <laughs> your house or, you know, your place of employment. And it's just got to the point where, you know, it's just like whatever people, you know, you play the little silly games. So, you know, I kind of got out of that a little bit. You know, I still, yeah. I'm still aware of it and I still share my information with everyone, as you can see on my websites. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, but I kind of got away from that and started focusing, you know, on more of the lost races and lost knowledge. Because yeah, that's important. Be, well, it is because if you don't know the other side of the coin, you don't know who the real enemy is. Yeah. And who your friend is, you know, and, and, you know, and, you know, that's where most people fall is from lack of knowledge. That's how most people are controlled is from lack of knowledge through, yeah. and, you know, through lack of knowledge, you know, the, the governments or, you know, the elite, whoever you want, whatever you want to call them, they, um, they use propaganda to fill your mind with nonsense and disinformation and that. And, um, and the next thing you know, you're, you're caught. You know, you're like a sheep in a pen or cattle in a pen, you know, that they can control you, whatever direction you want. So yeah, that's, that's the way they've been controlling since Sumer yeah. is, is propaganda on one side and emotional hatred on the other side. And, Neither one of them gets you anywhere. Right, exactly. So uh, you watch priests that mess with kids, no matter what the, what the religion. Much, you know. Uh, they tell the parents you have to, that I am God's spokesman, and you have to do what I say, and then then they're raping your kids. And, and the parent, and the worst part about it, the parents, because of how they've been brought up, um, 
the parents turn their heads to it, their eyes to it, and yeah, won't believe. The they, will, they, will, they won't believe the child, but will believe yeah. the perpetrator. Yeah. So. And it's not just one religion. Um, I looked into it in 2013, and it was every religion I looked at had this going up, going down. Well, religion is nothing but a, uh, it, it's nothing to, but a control factor. Yeah. You know, it, it, that's how, why religion, you know, prior to Christ, you know, it was more on, um, on the uh, magicians, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, um, uh, you know, um, various gods and, you know, and, and allowing you to, you know, to worship the gods, you know, that you chose. But then after, you know, um, the you old know, gods. after, the, after uh, Christ, you know, um, you know, with the, uh, uh, what was the Consul of Nicene, um, the, the Bible, or they realized that the population was growing to the point where they'd not be able to control them. So what they did is they created religion and then put people, you know, in care of the religions to treat, teach the people to follow the religion instead of, you know, what they were practicing before. And this way, but it was all due to being able to control and yeah, it was all about control, but the, yeah, the old gods time. were all pretty vicious <laughs> yeah. beings. But uh, I think the Native American, uh, uh, Native American Indians, all the indigenous people, you know, they kept their traditions, and uh, mm -hmm. and I think that um, they're better for it. But um, they went through a lot of hell too, you know, yeah. to follow their path, you know. Because remember how the, all the school kids, the kid children were taken away from their family members and put into schools, you know, and my uh, abused partner's grandmother survived one of those schools. Yeah, so, yeah, that's that's. Mm -hmm. She was yeah. treated better than most, but she yeah. was. That was still horrific. Yeah, it, it was so. And I mean, it, it's just not um, in North or not in the United States, just in the United States, it was all over, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, yeah. And, you know, there was always that, um, well, I, I believe it was uh, uh, the Anunnaki, you know, that uh, uh, started this whole thing, you know, as far as this uh, elitist group and, uh, and, you know, and they just kind of put themselves above everybody else and, and, and use the human race as their slaves, you know, and control them. And, uh, and it's still going on yet today. You know, I, I personally, I don't, I know that there was a lot of the Anunnaki that left, but I think that there was a lot that stayed as well. And they still have, yeah. uh, and they still um, carry a lot of uh, power and influence mm -hmm. on, on how um, society is run today. Well, they yeah. still have bases. Um, there's one in Puerto Rico. There's one in Tanzania. There's one in uh, Pine Gap, Australia. Uh, I understand there are still some in um, Beirut and some in Rome. Oh, they have they have them all over. You know, all over. I have a, a there. I have a website that uh, gives a list, you know, of every state, you know, in North America as well as every country, you know. I mean, they they got they have their ducks in a row. You know? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. but um, but I think that uh, we're giving them a run. Well, the biggest fear they ever had is that uh, we would end up with knowledge. Mm -hmm. that we, that eventually the truth would come out and they have done everything possible to keep that truth from coming out because they fear the human race. I really believe they fear us and, and what we could possibly do if we ever found out what they had done to us. And if uh, we so, ever got over our hatred of each other and well, figured well, they out. Were the ones that, I think that they're the ones that created the hate. You know, yeah. I, you know, um, 
because if you if you look at uh, the animal kingdom per se, and we're part of the animal kingdom, you know the animals don't hate each other. I mean, mm-hmm. they hunt. You know, there there's a, you know there there's the um, you know there's the predator and the prey, but that's because they eat. They're hungry. They eat. You know, but mm-hmm. they just don't go around killing each other for the thrill of killing. You know, uh, or yeah. for the and um, but for I think that. Yeah, and I think that this bloodlust was actually taught to us by, you know, the families of the Anunnaki, you know. Well, I'm pretty sure from the myths that that the Anunnaki bred us in part to be soldiers in their armies for off-world wars. Uh Uh-huh, and for as slaves, soldiers and slaves, yeah. And, That's um, what we were created for was soldiers and slaves. And for that, some reason they could not control the red haired race because of the magical qualities of the mag- of the red haired race of giants. And this was um and and the and they tried to create uh, a genocide, wipe them all yeah. out. I think what is there, there's only I think maybe two percent of the human race that has uh, red hair. Something like that, or green eyes, red hair, green eyes. I don't know. Because they, yeah, because they tried to wipe them out, and um, but uh, but you know what? Well, I get a kick out of people where, you know, they'll say, "Well, prove to me that there was giants on this earth." I said, "I can yeah. easily do that." There's there's giants here in modern times. Yeah, there are. You know, I mean. Where did they come from? A recessive gene. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I, I think that's one of the most silliest questions somebody can ask me is prove that there was giants in those days. It's even biblically said that there was giants in those days. Yeah, it is. It is. It's in all kinds of, of documents from all kinds of faiths that there were giants in those days and and that the giants got to where they were eating people so the people killed them off but the but here's another thing darling they say in their books it says the giants were cannibals well if you read my books you'll realize that the people the human race not the not the giants but the others the modern man the adamic man they were cannibals too Oh, yeah, they were. They were practicing cannibalism. They were practicing all sorts of things. Right. So, I mean, but they forget to tell you that side of the coin. They say, we tried to destroy the red-haired giants because they were cannibals. Well, they didn't say, well, we were too. Um, The creek were, were, my great-grandmother said that, that her mother's story was that the red-haired giants were good rulers until there was a famine and there wasn't enough food to eat. Exactly. And And that's what turned them all to cannibalism. Yeah, because they they simply, there wasn't enough food otherwise. And that the native people killed them in self-defense. But the native people were also. Yeah, the native people were also. Okay. The Winnebago, let's take that, the name Winnebago, for example. Do you know what Winnebago means? No. Cannibal. Does it? Yeah. I went to a high school in California called Menachi, and that meant fly eaters. You've got to be pretty desperate to eat flies. Yeah. We've had, uh, the earth has changed many, many ways. Well, I mean, let's go back biblically just a little bit. Um, so God created uh, God created the animals, then created man to watch over the animals, right? But now we know as a fact that all animals, birds, reptiles, all that stuff were giant in those days during you know during the Jurassic period and prior yeah. to, right? They were all giants. Mm -hmm. Why in the world would God have turned around, created these giant 
you know, animals, reptiles, birds, whatever. Why would he create it and plants everything gigantic and then created man to be five foot four? And then says you have rulership over the land and the animals. I mean, um, it sounds to me like sense, does it? It sounds yeah. to me like stories that people tell their children. You're loved, you're cared for, nothing's gonna happen, go to sleep. Well, the thing is, giants were first, in other words. Mm -hmm. you know? Because if if we had prehistoric dinosaurs. That were giants. We, the the man the mankind would have been the same thing. If the, everything was created so. as giant, so would man. And when you in my books, you see those pictures of gigantic footsteps. You mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, in the in the rocks. Yeah. Following a dinosaur. Yeah. Well. Or you'll see like in um, uh, South America, Chile and places like that, you'll see pottery where it's uh, the pottery is designed by man, but it has uh, designs of prehistoric animals. Mm -hmm. well, how would they have known what they were look like? Because they sure look the same today as they did back then when those people, you know, uh, designed those uh, patterns for their their pottery mm -hmm. so they had to have seen them yeah and then of course as animals decreased in size plants everything decreased in size so did mankind and now we're starting to see a comeback where things are getting larger again how, but now I'm not saying that it's going to be as large as the first, uh, you know, the first uh, mm -hmm. giant, but people are, are getting much taller because there was a time that people were averaged out about five foot four, five foot five. And now, you know, I mean, it's tough and see somebody seven foot, you know. Uh, I've got several friends that are around six and a half feet tall. Yeah. Um, give or take. And they just seem perfectly normal um they are they have um they have they but the ones that i know that are that height are all blonde or dark skinned the um you see a lot of people too uh showing the recessive gene of the di giants with um uh, double rows of teeth yeah, that was common to the skulls or six or, fingers from the mounds, wasn't it? Yeah, but I mean, it's a recessive gene. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, I have another book out called, um, um, uh, what is it? God's, Giants, Gods, and Lost Races. And, and in that book, I show, I show proof, evidence that... Um, uh, that there was uh, other races that have have uh, been here and have uh, expired and that we know nothing of, uh, such as uh, the little people, mm -hmm. uh, the hairy ones that we now call today, you know, the uh, uh, the Bigfoot. Uh, I, I was able to trace Bigfoot back all the way to the days of Gilgamesh and uh, his... Uh, uh, the wild man of the forest called um, that he uh, was he do. I mean, that is Bigfoot. There's no doubt about it. And so, you know, so we have, so we have very, and then we have uh, uh, monkey people, you know, um, we have, uh, uh, I mean, they were highly honored. I mean, there was uh, princes, uh, there was kings and that, you know, that, you know, that had the faces of the mon monkey man, the monkey king. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there was the reptilians. Um, there, there's been, you know, the, we, we think because we've been told that there's only one race in the human race, but there's so many races that evolved right along with the Adamic man. Mm -hmm. 
Some of them ex still exist today. Some are coming back through the recessive gene. Um, and some have been lost and, uh, and forgotten, never to be known again. And, and we've some are in artwork. Uh -huh. Except through our artwork, our writing and that. And, and this includes uh, all star visitors. And it also includes some, um, it also includes multidimensional uh, beings mm -hmm. and, and, and others that are coming through time, you know? Um, I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface of what is here around us, what well, has know. been, what is, and what will be. And <clears throat> at the conference I was at last weekend, um, one of the biggest problems I had was talking to people about my military experience in a space setting and that extraterrestrials were intelligent beings in physical bodies. Yeah. They could not wrap their heads around that they were in physical bodies, that they well, were de facto people. This is, uh, you, you see this all the time. And, and that's because people, they get so one tracked or, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, their mind is so one tracked. They can't, and, the, and if you're going to be a true researcher, you know, you don't want to be a gullible, of course, you know, right. uh, but you have to have an open mind to all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Listen to people. And if they're, you know, and if they're telling you something, don't just look at them and basically see them as a liar. You know, especially when you're getting the same type of information from all over the world, from people that have never spoken to each other or you know or had any sort of communication with one another but i mean you know like when somebody when i give people information i give it to them as a truth mm -hmm. and 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 i don't put something out there that i have not checked into you know yeah and um and when somebody, when I tell somebody something and they look at me and they don't believe me or they say, give me your proof, I'm done with them. Because, yeah. not because I hate them or anything, but it's because there are so many people out there in this world that want to know the truth. Why would I stop and waste my time with somebody that is so close mind that I had to stop doing what I'm doing and not be able to go forward anymore. I'd get stuck in the muck with them and that would be the end of it. And I think a lot of them out there do that purposely to keep you from going forward. That's and probably true. I, I remember, you know, like with, when I said I started the red haired, the stories on the red haired giant races, <clears throat> all these people tried stopping me. Now, if you know, first of all, I got caught in it, you know, and I was arguing and trying to prove to them, you know, why I believe this and why I was writing about it. But then it, it finally dawned on me that as long as I kept arguing with these people about what I knew to be true, I could not go forward yeah. with my work. I would be caught in their muck. So, you know, I, so with me, I'm available to everyone. Mm -hmm. and I write my books. I do my websites, my radio shows, what the interviews, all that. And I give my information to as many people that want to hear it. And if they don't, well, then so be it, you know, and God bless them, you know, but they're never going to learn truth if they close their mind to all the other possibilities out there. I agree. I have a question. Yes. Not based on what I read in your book, but based on one of the persistent stories that comes up in my community. Okay. I'll try to answer. And, and the, <clears throat> okay. In, in the context, it's, 
that the supposedly the Sioux people, mm -hmm. I don't know which subtribe, but the Sioux people say that underneath some of the mounds that there are red hair giants in stasis. In what? Stasis, suspended animation. And that if you are careful taking them out, that they come back to life. And they had said that the US government, the military was coming in and digging them up. And I, I was wondering if you knew anything about this. I've not been able to verify it. Okay. Now you're talking when you say Sue, you're talking about the Lakota, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, and who, who, how many people told you that? I mean, was that it's, a handful? It's a, was it a multitude? it's a persistent rumor in my community. And mm -hmm. I've, I've not been able to verify it. So I, I was wondering, okay. wondering okay. if you could. I believe that, of course, that there's a red haired giants. I also believe that there may be a lot of the red haired giants that are in suspended, um, you know, um, form. I do not believe that they're underneath the mound per se. I think that they're more suspended in more uh, inner earth. Um, but it depends on the size of the mound, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, if you know, because there's a lot of different types of mounds too. There's burial mounds. There's fortress mounds. There's um, uh, there's uh, mounds such as um, uh, that you uh, that you can go down into for religious rites that also have like tunnel systems that take you down into the inner earth. And if they are in any sort of suspended animation, then I would think common sense would tell me that it would be more in the, the deeper bowels where, you know, that they would be more protected and hidden, you know. Um, and they could also be, uh, uh, they could also be suspended in uh, some sort of a, a time warp, uh, a multi-dimensional time warp. Uh, they could be put into, you know, another dimension there's so many different places that they could be put. I do believe, however, though, that there are those that are in suspended animation. Yes. Okay. I just don't, just common sense doesn't make it yeah. for me that you would put, because I've seen what the mounds look like underneath the mounds and that. And, you know, like, uh, I, I just can't see if they're going to have these type of a, this type of a situation or program, I just can't see them put the government putting them someplace where they could actually be dug up and found. Mm -hmm. You know, they're too secret. You know, the government, our governments are too, you know, they're, they're too secretive, you know, to put something out there to be found. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. I, I, I was just, you know, but, you were the I, appropriate person that if anybody knew it would be you. No, there could be other people that know besides me and I could be totally wrong. This is only my opinion. Okay. okay. Because I mean, I, you know, yeah, you, gotta, I get it. you, you kind of got to throw common sense in there too, <laughs> Yeah, you know? You know, and you you know how the government operates. I know how the government operates. <laughs> and, and, you know. In plain English, if they can screw us over, they will. And, and I mean, you know, there's other ways to hide. They could be cloaking them for all we know. We yeah. just, I guess the get best thing to do is I can, I can give an opinion, but how they're actually doing it, only they know how. But I do feel that they probably are that they probably do have some of these red haired giants in suspended animation. You know, that would not surprise me at all. But where and how, don't know. But that's what's so nice about working 
all of us together as researchers instead of fighting one another or closing our minds is being able to talk about it, yeah. toss out ideas, possibilities, debates, and come out with some something that's productive. And that is what I try to encourage a lot of the researchers, whether it be you know, um, you know, researchers on ancient man, or whether it be uh, uh, multiple dimensional, um, um, you know, uh, realities or or uh, paranormal encounters or UFOs. Mm -hmm. You know, we all need to start. See, I, I see all of that as interconnected. It is so, actually. Yeah. And so I can't see one without kind of looking around, you know, getting input from the others. So if, if so, I always encourage, you know, the researchers to open up their minds to all these types of possibilities. And then we all discuss it instead of hating each other and fighting over who, who, you know, you know, who's got the most amount of letters behind their name or whatever, you know. <laughs> um. This is my dad always used to say, you know, he says sometimes he says you send how did he say it? You you buy them you buy them shoes and send them to school and what and all you get back is an educated idiot. You know, sometimes that uh, works like that, you know, it's just it's like um uh, my part my partner calls it you send them to school, they come home with a BS and then pile it higher and deeper. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, I mean, you know, we have been trained so much, you know, conditioned so much to to idolize these people, scientists, you know, or the scientist world, mainstream science, and that, and uh, and doctors and lawyers and presidents, you know, and you know, mm -hmm. all these you know people like that, that to the point where we don't question them, and we take away our power. Uh mm huh. -hmm. And our realization that we are just with our common sense and with the with our schooling of hard knocks and you know being out in the field that we're just as capable of an intelligent thought as they are. Well, we, I we was I was trained power. in uh, life sciences, physics, uh, chemistry, math in college. Yeah, and. I will say science is a method yeah. and the method is you have an idea, you test it. And if the test says you're wrong, you go back to the drawing board. And, and that used to be the way it was, but nowadays they won't even test it. They won't even acknowledge something exists. And that's, that's not how science is supposed to be. Not, that's not science. That's, no, no. that's no. just authoritarianism. Yeah, and that's what we have today as far as science goes, unfortunately. But there are a lot of, there was a physicist friend of mine that said that uh, um, new ideas and theories and discoveries come to be when the old die out. Well, what I've seen over my lifetime, I'm 66, what I've seen is ideas that were radical and couldn't possibly be right in the 1960s were accepted in the 1930s, nine, 1990s, the tongue took on a life of its own. And now here we are in the 2020s and they've got new ideas that are replacing them. And I'm looking at these and my jaws dropping open and I understand enough of them to see flaws in them. Yeah. But I saw the flaws in the others all along. And right. um, what I was taught in the space black ops is not consistent with anything they're teaching. Right. And I have a feeling that we are going to have to get to that before we will make progress on Earth. Oh, I agree. You know, there's, um, I, you know, you look at it and, 
a lot of these um, these um, uh, professors and you know um, uh, different people you know in the scientific world and physics and that you know they've written books they're getting mm -hmm. grants you know and but they have to go according to the uh, the the curricula of um, you know uh, of their peers or of their you know mm -hmm. um, you, you know of the, the the school you know or whoever's putting out the grant. They, and, have, and they have to go with what will be passed by a peer-reviewed journal, which means right. if it's too radical, it won't get printed. Which right. and if you don't get published, you get fired. Right, right. And so you know, so I I understand where they're coming from, but the thing is, if they're fearful, they shouldn't have started in that field to start with. Yeah. Because, I mean, it is a field of being the pioneer, of mm -hmm. being able to have that courage to go into worlds that that no one else is aware of and to find yeah. the answers that no one else has been able to do. And, you know, yeah. so, I mean, you know, the our, but, of course, because of finances, because, you know, commitments, you know, the, 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 they, they've sold out and um, and it's too well, bad because science is expensive imagine, yeah and can you imagine how exciting this world would be and all of us if the, if they would share everything so we could all participate and take that <laughs> all these great minds of all of us and bring you know and and share information but see without sharing information, well, that we we're stagnant, and I mean we're in the 21st century, mm -hmm. and we're still we're still dealing, or we're still living as if we were in the 19th century. We're worrying mm -hmm. about copyrights. We're <coughs> we're worrying about um, who owns your catalog. That's right. the proper term for music. We're worrying about who's going to pay the grants. We're worrying about who's going to pay you so that you can pay your employees because all of these labs re require employees. And those are people who have master's degrees or better. Master's degree is the entry level. And you have all of this money and you have to publish or get fired. You have to and jump that rope. You have to jump through all of this stuff. And then at the end, you end up with something that's frankly bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you expect the population to accept it because it's science. And, and you know, and, and the crazy part about it is most of the discoveries, you know, that uh, that science actually jumps on, you know, and does something with, has actually been discovered first by the farmer walking across his field and stumbles over a certain stone, yep. or uh, 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 another person, a hunter, his dog is chasing a fox, and the fox goes down into a hole, and the hole opens up to this whole cave system you know that leads yeah. into the under you know the underworld you know but you know the art artifacts are always found by the layperson mm -hmm. you know and then they share with is... the archaeological departments or those one whatever branch of science and then science will just kind of sit back there hee-haw about it maybe 20 years later they'll jump on it and but I mean, by suddenly that have a big discovery. Like once they found Gobekli Tepe, they suddenly found this other one, what, 20 miles away. So, yeah, that's and, how it and works. A life, and a whole lifetime has been wasted. Where, yep. where, where was the productivity? You know, it wasn't. And, um, and that's why my books, to me, that's why my books are so important. You know, is because I'm trying to get back there, get that information out. Because prior to, well, 
prior to the early 19th, uh, the early 1900s, like 1800s or middle 1800s, um, uh, late uh, 1800s, there was the, the science, I mean, the reporters, they reported finding these giant bones and these yeah, barriers yeah. and that. And, and, and the scientists would jump in there and go and check it out and they, and they would dig things up, you know, and, and, but more information was shared. And then when it got to be about the mid 1900s, that's when all of a sudden things started shutting down. And every, and every decade it got worse and worse and worse until maybe about, like you said, 20, 30 years ago, it finally started to open up just a little, little, little tiny bit. Mm -hmm. And now it's a, it, then it got open a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And finally people, it's opened up enough where I think that we've hit kind of almost there to hit mass critical point oh, where the yes. people start awakening and wanting more. And the biggest thing that ever happened to us to get this information out was the uh, internet. Because yeah. once the internet came out, there was no controlling the information. And trust me, this government has tried everything they can think of to be able to control the internet and the information that comes through it. They're still yeah. trying. Um, well, they're, they're not really succeeding all they're managing to do is piss off a lot of us <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're trying to censor you know but um, yeah. but i mean but but there with the internet i think we have hit mass critical point and um, yeah. you know the floodgates have opened and you're not going to put that genie back in the bottle you know but they're going to give it one heck of a shot but once people have tasted that freedom of shared information and learning and knowledge they they don't want to go back to the dark ages you yeah, know yeah. you know and um well and i'm still writing a book and like you it's on paper as well as as i plan to have an e-version but it's going to be on paper because things get edited and changed on you yeah. on the internet so i yeah. want a paper copy that yeah. will survive you know yeah. they may zap my computer but i'll have that paper copy and, yeah, and i totally agree with you this is one thing that i always do is make sure my information like i think i think i got 11 or 12 books out now i can't remember and still a few that you know of course i lost my husband this year so you know I'm sorry but, about that yeah, I was a prolific writer, and um, and I had been working on two or three other books, you know, when he got sick with cancer. But um, anyhow, so I have been holding back on those. But I've always felt that, you know, you, you can have your files, you know, your physical files and electronic files and that, but always make sure that you put it in book print as well. Mm -hmm. So it protects your work. And you got a physical copy that can will last forever, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, in libraries and that so that the knowledge continues, because yeah. if you lose that knowledge, then it could stop with you, you know. Well, I've been watching my community uh, be deleted by YouTube, be, yeah. to, be deleted by Facebook, yeah. uh, be shadow banned by Twitter. Uh, so we are, I got a server and I'm going to be archiving the video for the secret space program and super soldier videos, our history going back as far as Michael Ralph and Bill Cooper. Because yeah. they, they're the first ones I remember. I was next door neighbor to Bill Cooper. <clears throat> Bill Cooper was my hero. Yeah, I uh, he only lived a few miles from me up in the White Mountains of Arizona. No. Yeah, he he 
he was much more religious than I am, but he what he had courage and he documented a lot of things and yeah. and his, and he also had those uh, MJ twelve papers. Yeah, he, he had, had them. And he had them. Yeah. Yeah, he came yeah. out with a lot of information that was based on being Navy intelligence, and I had the absolute utmost respect for the man. Well, I uh, I gave I read the MJ twelve papers and uh, and I cried for I don't know three, four days. And then I realized how dangerous they were for me to have and my, and for my family. And so I gave the papers to another person and um, anyhow, and told them, I says, you keep them. And, uh, and I says, only expose them upon my death. That's how serious these papers were. And like I said, Cooper had them as well. But um, anyhow, since then, you know, I, you know, I, uh, since then, probably saying way too much because of your listeners, but um, since then, the papers have have disappeared, okay? I don't have them. My friend doesn't have them. He, he felt the same way as I do. So, you know, some things, you know, are just best not shared. I mean, because of the danger to your family, because as you know, yeah. with Black Projects, the those people need mean business, you know, it, uh, a lot of people talk about them, you know, and joke about these people, but, um, they're nothing to joke about. I mean, they're serious about keeping their secrets and, uh, you know, so I just ask, you know, say to you and everybody else, you know, that gets involved in this, just be careful, watch your back. And, uh, you know, um, you know, it, it's important to get the information out, but it's also, your life is also important too. Well, um, when I, I definitely see it, you know, so I, 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 just kind of I was being it. shot with energy weapons and yeah. my partner was shot with me at least one time. And by the third time I got shot, I talked to him and said, you know, Bill Cooper said, if they're going to kill you anyway, to go public, hide in the spotlight. And I said, are, are, and, and I've, always, I've always felt that too, you know, and uh, I, I, think, I think the worst thing a person could possibly do is to keep secrets because the more information you get out there, then it's no longer a secret. So you're no longer a threat. Well, um, he and I discussed it because I knew he would in, he was in danger too. Yeah, And he's not public exactly. I mean, he's been in, in my videos. People know him as Lou. They, and uh, they know that he does shamanic work with me. Um, but he doesn't go out and do his own videos. Yeah. And uh, after I went public the NSA team that activated my memories, both of them were killed. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. You have to be and careful. One was, I came forward in September of 2016. One of them was killed in December. The other one ha died in April the following year, 2017. Yeah. And, and the record, I just want to let you guys know that uh, your listeners... Uh, after you listen to this show, please do not contact me on what we're talking about right now because I am totally out of that field and doing my work with, you know, lost races and things like that. Yeah, but, she's she's dealing with, with the red-haired giants. She has nothing to do with this stuff. Right. Um, I, I, I'm well aware last, that, you know, but, you know. About this time last year, I started doing some interviews about comparative religion, about the religions of the old gods as practiced by some of the secret societies. Right, right. And I had two very close friends were murdered. And a third one was suicided. Yeah. Um, everybody thinks he killed himself, but he didn't own a gun. 
Yeah. And so I've been very careful about not talking about that. Yeah. So um, nobody else has been killed since. So there yeah. are very specific topics I'm not supposed to talk about. And yeah. for that reason, I don't. I, it wouldn't bother me so much if it were me they were killing, but they're killing people I care about, people who are innocent, who have nothing to do with it. Right. I totally understand where you're coming from with that. So yeah. um, for the folks who think I'm just crazy anyway, live your peace life in peace. peace. And yeah. leave have, like I said, you have to have an open mind. I mean, any, you know, I, I don't think, you know, I, I don't, I'm not impressed with people that uh, when somebody, because I have so many people that come to me with so many different ranges, you know, of, you know, things that they want to discuss. And I, I listen to them and I believe it as truth mm -hmm. because, you know, until proven differently. Yeah. The, you know, um, my first, uh, my initial, um, uh, uh, thought when they talk to me is never to think that they're crazy or that they're lying to me because that's so disrespectful. And, um, you know, so, and I mean, even some people, they may even uh, come across as delusional, but that doesn't make them delusional because yeah. you, you know, it, just because it, it's not the reality that you understand doesn't right. mean they're wrong. That's right, because um, especially when you're dealing with, uh, you know, things like Montauk or, you know, or some of the other, you know, black uh, projects, you know, that one book I was talking about was called Beyond Black. Okay. And um, yeah, but um, but I mean, th there's a lot of there's a lot of people that have gone through extreme, extreme, you know, um, terrors. You know, and of course yeah. they're going to come back as they're going to sound delusional to a person that has never experienced that type of word, world, but that does not in, in any form mean that that person is lying to them, you know. Yeah. And this is how I see people when they come to me and they talk, regardless of how strange it may sound to a lot of other people, you know, I, it does, it never sounds strange to me, you know, because I try to keep open minded on everything. You know, well, but I guess have, that's where empathy comes in, right? Yeah, we have about 10 minutes for you to shamelessly plug everything that you have going. Oh, wow. Shamelessly? <laughs> shamelessly, your books, your website, everything. Yeah. Well, okay, let's see. Uh, well, first of all, um, I am a writer uh, and I've been very successful with my writing. Uh, uh, I have uh, books um, um, at, uh, you know, the regular bo uh, uh, bookstores, uh, Walgreens, um, uh, Walmart, um, you know, um, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, they're being sold on Amazon.com. You can go to, uh, um, you can go to my website and get the, uh, get a signed or an autograph book uh, at burlingtonnews.net forward slash Books. Html. Um, again, burlingtonnews.net forward slash books. Html. Then I also have um, several groups and pages on Facebook um, that you can, uh, and so you know each group is separated. Of course, one is um, on. Um, ancient mysteries and um and various strangeness uh, and then i have another group on haunted woods tours that i do and then another one just kind of like keep you know just keeping up with everybody and um oh gosh there's well anyhow just go to go to facebook and just type in mary sutherland and um you'll find me i think uh my picture is uh, my blonde hair, and uh, I'm holding up my book. I think uh, of one of my one of my books. It shows a I think it shows a tiger or something on it. So look for that picture, and then it'll show the uh, all the various Facebook sites. Um, I have one of the world's largest uh, websites, um, hundreds and hundreds of pages, and most of them. Well, a lot of them are open to the public, and then of course I have membership where you know. Um, 
the, all my BUFO radio shows that I've done through the years are archived in there along with the, you know, special websites that, you know, are more private, you know, for my members. Uh, let's see. Um, with, and I'm an active member, um, you know, well, I'm an, an active researcher uh, in multiple, or I, I, what I'd like to do is I actually have the capability Few people have it, but I have one of those capabilities of being able to take a camera and actually photograph the what I call the invisible world, where I can photograph people actually stepping on their, I, where their etheric body is actually coming out of their physical body, going into other dimensions. I can photograph dimensional entities. Uh, uh, I can photograph, you know, like the, uh, spirits and ghosts and uh, all ectoplasm orbs, you, you know, um, I, I spa uh, you know, uh, UFOs. Um, so anyhow, a few people have that ability, but I do have that ability, and I've been doing it for and studying this invisible world through my camera for gosh, I think about 20 years now, and oh. uh, I probably have the most extensive amount of photos. On, in the world on multi-dimensional entities and the uh, and what goes on around us that we can't see or hear. And then I've got my books on spirituality and I have my books on hauntings and uh, also have uh, DVDs distributed um, through a distributor, uh, Reality Entertainment uh, out of California, which... Um, you know, they're in uh, Walmart, you know, various bookstores and stuff like that. Oh, uh, let's see. What else? I used to have a sci-fi cafe, a local meeting place for everybody to get together and share their stories. Um, I'm thinking about starting another one up this spring. I had closed it and my husband and me had moved here, you know, to this little area for a little R&R &R and for me to just concentrate more on my writing. But then I lost my husband this year, so I'm thinking about going back into uh, starting up another, you know, um, another business, you know, where we can all get, start getting together and sharing things again. Oh, let's see. Uh, it's got to be a little bit more that, that I do, but right now I can't think of anything. Um, I ask people to buy my books. That's um way that uh, books are my means of uh, supporting my work mm -hmm. uh, through you. So uh, I would appreciate that. Um, Christmas time coming up, uh, you know, um, it's always nice to, uh, you know, order my books. And also I have an online store. So you can just go to burlingtonews.net forward slash UFO store dot hotmail or html or bro or you go to living in the light ms.com forward slash little bits l i t l b i t s dot html and there i sell make, metaphysical and make sure um, you put these links in messenger and i'll put i'll add them to the recording of, of the video Okay, and I, in, in the store, I sell uh, metaphysical stuff uh, as well as uh, I have a UFO store. So a lot of people like to go in there and buy props and things like that. You know, that's kind of a fun little store. So, yeah, we kind of get around in this little town, you know. So we have fun. <laughs> okay. We have fun. I, I live in the area where Sonora Aero Club was. So um, we have our own little weirdnesses here, too. I love Bigfoot anymore. That is where right at this point in the time, you know, I've got all my books and everything, but somehow I'm starting to feel, I don't know. There's just something about this, the, this, um, the mystery of Bigfoot and, you know, tracing him back to Gilgamesh and, um, uh, yeah, that's, and, uh, that's and a new one for me and, mm -hmm. and made absolutely perfect sense. Yeah. And I, and I have the, the full story about that in one of my books so you know oh. and and the creation of man you know by the anunnaki and the giants so yeah you know adam was a giant you know 
I see. And uh, Noah was a giant. Uh, they were, that whole family was the line of giants on Inaki bread. And when they say, well, well with uh, uh, Noah, that his blood was not, God chose him because his blood wasn't corrupted. They yeah. meant that he wasn't corrupted by human blood because yeah. he was he was an on, Anunnaki uh, hybrid. So his blood was, as far as they were, con God was concerned, was the purest of all. So that, so Noah actually was saved to continue the Anunnaki bloodline. So, he was saved my to father the new race. You're right, right. And that's all in my books, you know. So, and you, like I said, you can get them at Amazon.com or BurlingtonNews.net forward slash books.html. And I'll put that in Messenger for you. Thank you. Yeah, you're more than welcome. What else do I do, Kathy? Oh, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but we have, okay. we have fun. How's that? We have fun. That's awesome. We enjoy people. And I'm always available, you know, on my Facebook. Read tarot. Oh, I read tarot, too. Mm -hmm. I do cards, yeah. And... Uh, and uh, oh. and I and I teach a uh, uh, healing a uh, Reiki healing mm. and um, and um, angelic healing as well and I don't know what I do. I, there's no. a lot. <laughs> there's a lot, but um, so yeah, it sounds like you're staying busy. Well, you know, what I try to do, I think that I like most about myself, if I can do that, is uh, say that I'm always approachable for everybody. You know, I mean, you'll see a lot of places, uh, these authors and other people that will put up Facebook sites, you know, and, you know, and, and everybody joins so that they can talk to that certain person. But if you ever yeah. notice on my Facebook, anybody that writes something on my Facebook, I always answer. Mm -hmm. I, I never, have noticed that. Yeah, I have. Ever, to, as far as I'm concerned, everyone is as important as the other person. Yeah. If they take the time to write on my site or contact me, then then at least I should be at that level where I can communicate back and forth with them, you know, on a personal level. Well, That's, on that note, I need to tell my public I'm having surgery on november 30th and i'm going to be unavailable for a couple of months so um i don't want anyone thinking i'm neglecting them well we all send you prayers here for past evening uh, i had a okay. neck injury in 1977 and they're finally going to do a spinal fusion to fix it so, uh, all of their prayers are there for you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming. And Daryl, are we ready to go? Yes. Okay. We are always ready, Penny. Say good night, everybody. It was nice meeting you, Daryl. Wonderful meeting you, too. Thank you. Yeah, that was Mary Sutherland. 